On today's Leading Edge, we'll look at the discovery of a new element, element 113. Dr. Oka, this element was named Nihonium by a Japanese research team in November 2016. This is the first time that a country in Asia has been allowed to name an element. I didn't know that. So what kind of element is it? First, let's look at the periodic table of the elements. It is an arrangement of the atoms that form the basis for the matter found in the world. At present, it extends to the seventh row and a total of 118 elements are known. Various elements were created along with the birth of the universe. Oxygen, hydrogen, sodium, many of the elements are familiar in our everyday lives. All of the elements up to 92 uranium were discovered in the natural world. However, the elements from 93 and onwards were artificially created. Artificially? How can new elements be created artificially? The element number is the number of protons found in the nucleus of the atom. In this research, element 30, zinc, and element 83, bismuth, were collided together. The nuclei fuse, so the number of protons is 30 plus 83, which equals 113. The principle may be simple, but the actual research was extremely difficult. Let's see where this all took place and learn how Nihonium was created. A Japanese research group has named the new element 113 Nihonium. Playing a central role in the research group is Dr. Kosuke Morita of Kyushu University. As a scientist, it is a tremendous honor to leave an indelible mark on the periodic table. So how was the new element Nihonium created? This is the Riken Nishina Center for Accelerator-Based Science in Saitama Prefecture's Wako City. Inside is an enormous piece of equipment. This large apparatus that spans 70 meters is needed to create just a single atom of the new element. Let's see how it's set up. First, this part here serves to discharge the atoms that will be collided. In here, a bar of element 30, zinc, has been installed. By bombarding it with high-speed electrons, some 2.4 trillion zinc atoms will be released in just one second. Meanwhile, element 83, bismuth, the other element in the collision, is installed here. This is the bismuth target. Attached near the edge of the disk are thin films of bismuth. This disk is then rotated. This is because the 2.4 trillion zinc atoms that arrive within one second are not concentrated in one place. The zinc atom collides with the bismuth atom, and if nuclear fusion occurs, this will theoretically make the element 113. However, that is far from simple. If the speed of the zinc is slow, they will not collide, since the nuclei repel each other. On the other hand, if the speed is too fast, they will not fuse well and will end up splitting into two. Scientists have to attain just the right speed. This accelerator plays an important role in making that possible. Since the accelerator extends out over a length of 40 meters, the zinc can be adjusted to just the right speed. Let's see how it works. Looking closely at a zinc atom, we see that several electrons are moving around the nucleus, almost like a cloud. Since the nucleus is comprised of protons and neutrons, it has a positive charge. Yet since the surrounding electrons have a negative charge, the atom is neutral overall. However, when the zinc is bombarded, some of those electrons are stripped off. The zinc has an overall positive charge when it comes down the accelerator. 
Inside the accelerator are tubes and a high frequency electrical current is run that can quickly change the tubes into a positive or negative charge. When the positive zinc reaches this tube, it is first pulled by the negative charge, then repelled and pushed forward by the positive charge. Repeating this process causes it to accelerate. By varying the speed of this change and the strength, the zinc can be accelerated to the optimum speed for nuclear fusion. The speed needed to create element 113 is 10% the speed of light. The scientists attempted to synthesize element 113 by colliding zinc into bismuth at this speed. So the process of accelerating atoms requires very fine adjustment, and the collision speed has to be exact. But why did they combine element 30 zinc and element 83 bismuth to make element 113? There are other combinations that add up to 113, such as element 50 tin and element 63 europium. In order for there to be nuclear fusion among the atoms, the scientists have to overcome the repellent force of the respective nuclei. That repellent force becomes stronger in proportion to multiplying the two atomic numbers. That's why it's better to have a combination that multiplies into a smaller product. In the case of this experiment with zinc and bismuth, 30 times 83 equals 2490. In your example, 50 times 63 equals 3,150. So the product in the experiment is smaller. Then what about colliding the atoms of element 112, copernicium, and element 1, hydrogen? The product of their atomic numbers is 112, which would be even smaller. So wouldn't that be OK? Well, yes. But since the lifespan of the element 112, copernicium, is only about 0.0001 second. It cannot be used as a target. They needed to use a more stable element. Of the stable element, element 83, bismuth, has the heaviest nucleus. I see. So that's why they used elements 83 and 30. Even then, getting the nuclei to collide together is a very difficult task. Have a look at this. This is a diagram of a zinc atom. The nucleus is in the very center and around it is a cloud of electrons. But in reality, the nucleus is much, much smaller. The diameter of the nucleus is about one one hundred thousandth of the overall atom. This means you are trying to hit a one centimeter nucleus inside a ball with a diameter of one kilometer. Wow, I can see why trying to collide them would be so difficult. Since they cannot target the collision, they release 2.4 trillion zinc atoms in one second. 2.4 trillion? However, even if the atoms do collide with each other, the probability of nuclear fusion is only about 1 in 100 trillion. 1 in 100 trillion. That's such an incredibly small number to comprehend. That's why it really is incredible that they were able to create a new element. Moreover, they are still not done even after creating a new element. What do you mean? They have to detect and prove that they were actually able to create a new element. Here is the equipment for extracting just a single atom of the new element from the large amount of zinc. Actually, it is not that difficult to remove the large amount of zinc. By applying a magnetic force to the atoms flying down, their direction of movement can be curved. This is because when the orientation of the magnetic field is pointing downward and the electric current is heading to the right, a force is exerted in the direction opposite to the screen. The size of the force will change depending on the atom's charge and mass. Since the charge and mass of element 30 zinc and the new element 113 are completely different, scientists can extract only the new element. So there won't be any problem if the remaining element 113 enters the detector. However, what happens after this is actually very difficult. Dr. Koji Morimoto has also been working with Morita on the research to create the new element. 
When nuclear fusion between zinc and bismuth occurs, and the new element jumps out, we don't know how many electrons are surrounding it. If you know the number of electrons and can decide the charge, adjust to that charge, and set this with the magnet, then you could guide the new element into the detector. What he is saying is that normally atoms have the same number of electrons as protons, so this means the overall charge is zero. However, when the new element jumps out from the thin film of bismuth, it drops several electrons. That number varies each time. This is a big problem. That's because if the number of electrons is different, the charge will also be different, and the force exerted will also change. Even with two atoms of element 113, when one has a plus one charge with one less electron, and the other is plus two with two less electrons, they will end up moving in different directions since the exerting force differs. This means the new element might slip away. So Morita wondered if he could make the charge fixed and supply the electrons using helium gas inside a magnet. Helium has two electrons. When element 113 passes through helium gas, it both takes electrons from the helium and gives up electrons to it. He realized that even if the new element's electrons differ from their initial state as this happens, the charge will ultimately be plus 12 on average. If the charge is known, then the magnet can be adjusted and set so that the new element will fly off towards the detector. Morita did this and completed preparations to detect the new element in 2001. The experiment was conducted on a 24-hour schedule. Three years later, on July 23, 2004, that day finally arrived. Morita just happened to be in the laboratory that day. I was thinking that I should probably start to return home for the evening. And as I came into the laboratory to tell Morita, I'm leaving now, I noticed that right at that moment, the computer was displaying a screen we had set to open when the new element was observed. I knew we'd finally succeeded in our efforts. I was thrilled, and so right away, I called out to Morita, who was in the back of the room. Hey, we found it! This is that screen. A white square is displayed. This white square itself is a sign that the new element flew into the detector. That was the moment it captured element 113. That's incredible that they continued to maintain a 24-hour watch for three years. I can only imagine how happy they were. My thoughts exactly. If they didn't continue believing that they would definitely be able to discover it, this remarkable achievement would not have happened. There was a red X overlapping the white square that proved the creation of element 113. What was that for? That was proof that element 113 underwent alpha decay. Alpha decay is a phenomenon in which an atomic nucleus emits an alpha particle and ends up becoming a smaller element. An alpha particle is a helium nucleus which consists of two protons and two neutrons. Basically, it is thought that element 113 underwent alpha decay and has its protons reduced by two, thus becoming element 111. There is not just one X mark, but four. That's because the alpha decay continues and creates element 109. This shows that it then continues on to element 107 and finally changes into element 105, dubnium. So this means the new element nihonium underwent alpha decay four times until it became element 105. It decayed right after it was created. The average lifespan of nihonium is about 0.002 seconds. 
That is such a brief moment, but I assume it makes a huge difference in the world of science. By the way, Morita and his colleagues first succeeded in nuclear fusion of the new element in the year 2005, yet they only received naming rights at the end of 2015. Why did it take such a long time? Repeatability is a requirement in scientific research. That's why Morita and his colleagues had to succeed in synthesizing element 113 several times. Moreover, the result of their experiment was achieved in an irregular way, so their first creation of element 113 was not recognized. As a matter of fact, the process of alpha decay after the creation of element 113 was irregular. Let's take a look at what happened. Element 113 undergoes alpha decay four times until it becomes element 105, dubnium. Actually, it was thought that normally undergoing alpha decay for a fifth time would result in element 103, lawrencium. However, after undergoing alpha decay four times and becoming element 105, the first two atoms of element 113 that Morita and his colleagues created experienced nuclear fission and split into two atoms. Since it was thought there was a high probability of undergoing alpha decay for a fifth time, scientists question why this alpha decay did not occur, which is one of the reasons why the naming rights were not immediately recognized. So what did Morita and his team do then? They proved that element 105, dubium, could undergo nuclear fission. At the same time, Morita and his colleagues also continued their attempts to create element 113. In 2012, when they succeeded for a third time, element 105, dubium, successfully underwent alpha decay, and changed into element 103, Lorentzium. After further alpha decay, it became element 101, Mendelevium, which has a well-known nucleus. So they were 100% certain at this point. So they finally had enough proof to receive the naming rights for element 113, and they named it Nihonium. I wonder what Morita and his colleagues are working on now. Well, actually, they were currently preparing to create elements 119 and 120. So they're already aiming for even further elements. Why is that? Just how far do the elements go? In trying to find an answer to that question, we may come to discover a whole new world. Moreover, we will have to develop even more advanced scientific techniques to synthesize unknown elements. Continuing to search for new elements may lead to further development in the world's basic research.